Starch Press. Um, um, all right, let me introduce our speakers. Today we have Janeth Wirasinga and Rachel Greenstadt, who have re recently moved from Drexel to NYU. And they are known be for beating machine learning until it gives up its answers. And today they're going to talk to us about some of the results they have found. Machine learning models that predict mental health and, and the stuff they give away, right? And the information that they shouldn't be telling us. Please welcome our speakers. Thanks. Um, I'm Rachel, and I'm an academic. It's been 10 years since my last MUCON presentation. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a professor at NYU. Jonathan, most of the technical work on this, on this talk, so, you know, ask him all the questions. It'll be great. Uh, yeah, we like to, we like to reverse engineer uh, machine learning models, especially those that use NLP in my lab. And this talk was particularly uh, sort of inspired by the fact that there is a lot of interest and concern in this community around mental health and, and so on. So we were interested in some reports of machine learning models that could detect mental health conditions. So before I go any further, um, a little content warning that this talk will deal with uh, issues of depression and PTSD and mental health stigma. So if this is something that you think is going to be not best for your mental health situation, this would be a great time to leave or you know, put your headphones on and stare at your phone or whatever, I won't mind. Um, that said, a lot of the uh, approaches I've taken in the past to giving really engaging and fun talks have been to kind of be informal and flippant and irreverent, which isn't very appropriate for this. But So I'm going to try and get the, the tone right, but we'll do my best. So, social media. People say things off the cuff. Um, and there's this interesting research question of, can the words that you use when you're updating your status on social media give away your mental health status inadvertently? Um, there was a 2015 study out of Johns Hopkins that basically said yes, which uh, got some press around it. And we had, we had some questions about it, which is basically like, so what's actually going on here? Is this actually detecting your mental health status, or is it something else? Can we learn something cool from it? So we did sort of some reverse engineering of this study um, to understand what was going on, and we're going to talk to you about what we've learned there. Uh, and what was kind of our, our motivation for doing this? Well, on the one hand, um, this work is kind of cool and interesting and promising. Maybe we can get some useful insights about mental health, understand how disease conditions can affect language use, uh, maybe there's some potential for early diagnosis or getting people help they need. Maybe there's some, po some potential for platforms to intervene and prevent self-harm. Okay, that sounds a little creepy. Um, in fact, this is a case where uh, the Samaritans, who like, are concerned about suicide, put out an app that was trying to monitor people's Twitter feeds and, and intervene, and, and they eventually pulled it because it was creepy. And to expand on that, right, like nobody really trusts social media companies to do the right thing with sensitive data, right? See the last three years. So people, and in particular, mental health information um, is one of the more sensitive areas of information. And people want and deserve agency over how they present their mental health status and who knows about it and so on. And we could see a lot of potential abuses here around things like custom ad audiences. So in the last talk, there was a lot of talk about different ways to abuse ads. But typically, when people engage with social media companies, uh, they can, there are a lot of ways that you can advertise. You can advertise to people with certain interests or people in certain demographics. But you can also just build like a, a list of people and advertise to them. And maybe these methods would be ways for, to build lists of people that have certain conditions. And that's, I don't know, that's worrisome to me. So I wanted to understand how much of a threat that was and what was going on with some of this work. So to talk about the actual study that happened. So um, this was done at a workshop called the CL Psych Workshop. It's for computational linguistics and psychology. And um, they basically, it was kind of like one of the uh, contests that we do at these cons where they created a shared task, where they found, they created a data set of, of Twitter accounts who had self-reported uh, mental health diagnoses. 
um, users with depression, users with PTSD. And then age and gender match controls, and the shared task was for different research groups to see if they could build classifiers um, that differentiated, differentiated these groups from the, from the condition groups from the control groups. And so they would take tweets like this and say, okay, we can consider this a, um, you know, a, a person that has depression. And so how did these do? Well, like I said, there are a number of different groups, and so they, they, the, their results varied, but with the best results in the like, high 80s percentile, and the, the, like the, even the not great results were in the like in the 70s, um, and we're not going to necessarily. I'm I'm not going to talk as much about the details of the features that they used, though Jonathan is going to get into that. But what's interesting initially to us was so these are all all sort of the words that you choose, the various sort of variations on that theme, and it deals with sort of what you're talking about rather than uh, how you say it. So our first hypothesis is maybe this isn't a big deal. Maybe it's all about what you, maybe it's all about just people that talked about mental health issues on Twitter and it's the topic of the conversation, not the underlying condition, since we know that that's how they built the data set in the first place that is what they're keying off on. So if that were the case, it would be a lot less creepy, but also less useful. So. Our first sort of little experiment was to see how much mention of mental illness and discussion of that happened in this data set. So we were looking at, now, when they built the data set, they removed that initial tweet that caused them to put the person in the data set in the first place, but one quarter of the people with depression mentioned their diagnosis a second time and it was in the data set, and a third of the people with PTSD mentioned their diagnosis a second time and that was in the data set. So that alone, like, is a pretty straightforward thing. And then you can see from these word clouds here that there was still like quite a bit of um, mental health related content uh, with high information gain, meaning it was highly, the classifier find it, found it highly um, discriminatory in terms of being able to, to sort these groups. So we were interested in finding out what is the effect that these mentions have on the prediction accuracy of the classifier. So I'm good. with that I'm going to turn things over to Jonathan. Um, hi, everyone. So um, we wanted to filter out mental health related tweets. So to do this, we used machine learning. So what we did was we took a sample of tweets and labeled them to indicate if they talk about mental illnesses or not. And then we trained a classifier to label the rest of the tweets. We made sure that this classifier has a high recall so that we know for sure all the mental health related tweets are identified. In the end, we ended up removing about 1.3% uh, of tweets from, on average, from each, each, each user. Now, this may not sound like a lot, but remember that like, the words in these tweets were the ones that had the highest information grain. Um, so now that we have uh, all the mental health related content removed from the data set, we wanted to go back to our main prediction task. To do this, we used four feature sets. Um, the bag of word features uh, contain the frequencies of each word in the data set. Um, now, tackling social media language is not easy. People express the same idea, same word, in multiple ways. We used a set of word clusters where words that are related to each other are grouped into, into these clusters. So for example, instead of treating all the different ways of be, where people can say LOL, there's a lot of ways. Uh, we, instead of treating them as different tokens, we clustered them and treated them as a single token. And next, we wanted to know if there are any grammatical level differences in the language. So to do this, we use part of speech tags as another feature set. Now, uh, one of the best performing systems of the CL Psych workshop used topic models based on supervised LDA. Basically, what this approach does is, is discovers the underlying topics that the users are talking about by considering words that appear close to each other. So we used different combinations of these feature sets and fed them to an SVM classifier. And here are the prediction results. The two key points that I want to make here is that we only observed a slight performance drop between the full version of the data set and the filtered version of the data set. So this means our initial hypothesis that probably that these classifiers are just picking up on the active mentions of depression was wrong. Um, 
and the and the models uh, were probably able to pick up mental illnesses even if the users were not actively talking about it. And the second point is that the SLDA plus bag of words approach, the topic modeling plus bag of word approach performed the best. But the combination of other features performed quite well too. So okay, what, what are these classifiers picking up to detect mental illnesses? So we did a feature analysis. The goal of our feature analysis was to, one, understand the machine learning model, and two, to discover any language patterns that distinguish users with mental illnesses from those who don't. To do this, we looked at individual features that had high information gain and have significantly different values between the control and the positive users. So here are the results of uh, the feature analysis. So first, let's look at the depression versus control uh, prediction task, and let's look at the important features for the bag of words and word clusters feature set. Here, the size of the words and uh, the word clusters represent the information gain. And the color, if, if, it, if it is shaded red, that means it's closely associated with the positive group. And if it is shaded blue, it's closely associated with the control group. So for example, uh, we see that users who had depression tend to use more profanity, words like I, myself, conjunctions like and and because, uh, intensifiers like so much. Um, and then the control group use words, uh, use social media abbreviations, uh, words that deal with day-to-day -day life stuff and days of the week more often. Um, and on the PTSD versus control prediction task, we see uh, PT P users who had PTSD tend, again, uh, tend to use more words about that describe self-focus, words that describe pain and suffering, and then some military and war-related words. And the control group use more words that describe things about routine activities and days of the week. And if you look at uh, the feature analysis for the topic models, we see a similar pattern. Topics that talk about routine activities, social media abbreviations, and some profanity tend to have high information gain. This is not surprising because we are looking at the same content through like different angles. And when we looked at the part of speech tag features, we saw some interesting patterns here as well. Uh, now there's a lot going in this table, but I've highlighted some of the interesting part of speech tags. Uh, for example, both users who had PTSD and depression tend to use conjunctions more, like words like and and but. And users who have depression tend to use uh, part of speech tags like nouns, adjectives, and adverb combinations uh, more often, things like I'm not, I'm so, I'm pretty sure. And then users who had PTSD tend to use uh, personal pronouns, past tense, and past participle verbs uh, more often than the control group. Usage examples include things like I was told, I was gonna. So overall, what we saw, he saw here is that there are other signals in language that are predictive of one's mental health status. So what are the possible applications? Well, our research and previous research that's done on this area shows that uh, the classifiers, uh, the performance of, uh, of the classifiers in, predict, uh, in de predicting depression tend to fall somewhere between the performance of primary care physicians diagnosing depression through clinical interviews and screening inventories or screening questionnaires that are designed to diagnose uh, depression. This can also be used as a research tool because there's a lot of social media data and th this can be collected and analyzed at a large scale and would be cheaper than doing uh, a clinical level study at the same scale. But what about the unethical and malicious uses that we talked about earlier? Uh, what about targeted advertising using custom audiences and uh, data brokers? So one thing that we have to uh, think about here is that the results here are based on a balanced data set. But the number of, people, number of people with a mental illness in the general population is very low. And these classifiers tend to have a high false positive rate. So we, need to, we, we have to be careful here not to fall into what's called the base rate fallacy. That is, if we pick someone at random and the classifier predicted them as positive as having depression, Still, the chances of them actually having depression is quite low because of the low prior probability in the population and the uh, high false positive rate. 
Similarly, if we, if we ran this classifier on all of Twitter and collected a list of people who were predicted at, as positive, still, um, some of them would actually have depression, but most of, them, most of the cases would be false, false positives. We also did a misclassifications analysis to better understand our model and see where it fails. Uh, so if you look at the PTSD uh, prediction task, some of the false positives, that is uh, control users who are identified as having PTSD, some of the reasons that we thought uh, we identified for those was uh, these people tweeted more military related content or like certain sports. Or, or these people expressed a lot of anger or sadness in their Twitter feed. And if some of the reasons for false negatives was uh, these particular users had non-military related PTSD, for example, postpartum PTSD or PT PTSD after a sexual assault. And some other users posted a lot of positive sentiment or had posted a lot of emojis, and that was probably one of the reasons for their false negatives. And this also, uh, teaches us uh, about some of the undesirable biases that the machine learning algorithms would learn. Um, and if you go to the depression side, um, some of the reasons for false positives was uh, people tweeting a lot of self-focused tweets, tweets about relationships, difficulties in life, and then uh, users who had interests that were shared by mo uh, most of the users in the depression group for example, certain bands or music, like One Direction. <laughs> um, and some of the reasons for false negative was uh, we, we saw a couple of instances where people had depression either a long time ago or whose depression was well controlled with medication. So in fact, this is not a false negative. Um, and then there was also a lot of content issues where people tweeted a lot of social media abbreviations and emojis and things like that. So can we, can we use what we saw in our misclassification analysis as a possible mitigation? Um, for example, can we remove tweets that push towards a positive classifier decision? Or could we add more tweets, like tweets with a lot of LOLs or smiley face emojis, uh, to push the classifier towards a negative decision? So what we found in our analysis is that for most users, just by changing 10% of their tweets, we were able to flip the classifier decision. Now, there are other safeguards that can be done. For example, policymakers could implement more policy level safeguards. And another thing that social media platforms could do is detect targeted advertising through a system like this by, uh, by flagging custom audiences that show higher than normal levels of positive users. But still, this might not be a good idea uh, with everything that's happening these days. So in conclusion, uh, the main reason for our study was to understand how these machine learning models work. Um, and the issue of interpretability is very important. And in our case, studying machine learning models taught us a lot about how mental health impact one's language use. For example, we were able to confirm some of the previously known things. People with depression and PTSD tend to use more personal pronouns. And we also saw some new language patterns a high usage of conjunctions, intensifiers, and past participles. Um, but of course, these need to be validated through a clinical study. And what about the privacy concerns? Um, we learned that models can identify mentally ill users even if they're not actively talking about their diseases. We also saw that it is costly to create a list of mentally ill users with a high degree of accuracy from the general population. We also saw that detection can be avoided by altering your content slightly. So with that, I would like to end the presentation. Do you wanna add anything? Yeah, I just am gonna make a, a brief sort of shameless plug for if you're interested in uh, work that's at the border of AI, machine learning, and security, I'm uh, chairing a workshop at Usenix Security called Skynet. Uh, it's gonna be all talks, no papers. The call for participation is out now, uh, so come talk to me or, or find that for details. Thanks. I think we have a, a minute or so for a question or two, so. We have a question from the uh, streamer. Okay. Uh, have you analyzed Donald Trump's <laughs> yeah. 
We on yeah. No, no is the no, short no. answer. Um, but you know they're public, and um, you know these methods are 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 out there. So you know, go to town. This. There's another question. Did you look at any other? Um, aspects of the accounts, like so the number of followers, common accounts that they followed, time of day, number of tweets, uh, frequency of tweets, things like that? So um, we didn't actually collect the data set ourselves, and it was sort of semi-anonymized for the protection of the, the users the, that were in it. So no, we didn't do any of that because we don't have any of that information, um, which I'm OK with. Yeah. But, but there were other studies that had done like a similar, similar analysis, and those things are some are, are predictors like time of day that you tweet and like your follower network. Um, were you able to control for veteran status to ensure that your classifier isn't simply detecting that someone has a military background? We weren't. We weren't um, able to control for that, and that was kind of what we were getting at with our misclassification slide. That we actually think that the the. It, that the, the approaches that were taken before, it may very well be just a veteran classifier, which is kind of unfortunate. And that's the sort of thing, the reason why doing this kind of an analysis is really important and not just being like 80% accuracy, woo, right? So 